Well, good afternoon, and this is the uh, one. Uh, I, it doesn't with the last speakers, but it will be with you lot. This is the graveyard time. This is when you can go to sleep. There's not going to be much uh, on the screen. That's all you're going to get. So you can go quietly to sleep, and it's good because um, I should be quoting uh, because I'm going to be thinking about the issue of ethics and the basis of science. I'm going to embarrass everyone because I'm going to talk bits and pieces from the Bible. Now, don't panic. I don't think Noah's Ark, <laughs> I don't think the earth was created 6,000 years ago, anything like that. I don't, in fact, think that the Bible is a scientific textbook and never was intended to. Uh, but I am nonetheless going to quote a few scriptures from there. But also, I'd like to quote uh, our, our speaker on um, CO2 and sea level, which I love the one about, um, in God we trust but all others bring data. And I think that's an admirable and excellent start to uh, a discussion of the ethics in science. I'm going to move that round a bit. We had an Archbishop of Canterbury a thousand years ago here in Britain whose name was Anselm. And I quote him in English, you'll be happy to hear. He was Anselm of Aosta, in fact. I suspect he was an Italian. Uh, and he said this. For I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. I want you to keep that in mind. Because scientific inquiry, all that we've been talking about in these last two days, is by default and by definition a skeptical pursuit. That is what we are about. If you are a scientist, you are by, def by default, rightly, a skeptic which is why I think it's so absurd that we're called skeptics as if it's some kind of insult. Because it is that method that has proved in the past so remarkably fruitful from research into medicine to computers to astrophysics to quantum theory and indeed even in issues of meteorology and climate as well as geology in so many areas. To be skeptical about your investigations and to test them is the essence of good science. But, and Niels had this uh, picture of Atlas carrying the world, and in fact, I think it was Archimedes who said, give me a fulcrum and I can move the world. Actually, science as a lever, which it is, needs a fulcrum. It needs an anchor, a baseline from which to act. Because all of us who are scientific or have a scientific background, as to some degree I do, we all instinctively rely on what that base is without sometimes articulating it. It is that the universe we are looking into is reasonable. It operates a cause to reasonable laws that are in principle discoverable, that these laws are consistent when we discover them correctly, and as I said, are by default therefore discoverable and researchable. Now, I don't expect every scientist to sit down every morning and scratch their head and think, why do I believe that? Because I think actually that way madness lies, uh, because it would drive you mad. But the question remains, why is the universe comprehensible? And why can human beings make headway in this comprehension? It's partly, I think, we ask the question because we are more than just scientists. The question stands whether you ask it to yourself every day. But in a sense, the reasonableness of the cosmos has to be treated, in effect, as an axiom of research. Because if we did an experiment today, which was not repeated tomorrow when we tried it, it did something completely different, we would be out at sea. And I suppose it's fair to say, and I say it cautiously, that ancient cultures which had not got specific ideas about this, these questions, tended in t to be polytheistic and often did not progress in any meaningful way in the sciences because from their perspective, their uh, gods could do anything and therefore there was no point in trying to work out what they were up to. So, science needs a platform. And my contention would be that among all religions, Judaism and Christianity, with its stress on a deity, call him what you will, who created all things, is a good platform to begin. Quoting the old Torah, that is the old Jewish Testament, and the Gospel of John, one of Jesus' followers, they both begin their writings, in the beginning, 
And in Genesis is God created the heavens and the earth. And in John's Gospel, we read these words in Greek. En arche en ho logos. In the beginning was the word, the logic, the logos, the reason, which is the foundation of everything. Now, some might argue, well, John was just quoting from the Greek Stoics, but actually he was not. He was quoting, in effect, from the Old Testament. I haven't time to read it. Uh, I don't want to keep you long, as Henry VIII would say to a new wife. <laughs> Sorry. But there's a wonderful passage in uh, the Hebrew book of Proverbs about wisdom, Sophia, uh, and about how wisdom was the very skilled craftsman who brought about the world and indeed was God's agent. So before modern science really got going at all, here I contend in the Logos is an undermining, an underpinning requirement. The Bible is not a book of science. It doesn't purport to be so. And I must say, I see the wars of science and religion, and there have been some pretty disgraceful moments on both sides. Uh, and as our uh, recent speaker, uh, Pamela, said, I think at the moment the Christians are in the dog doghouse there at the moment, in certain quarters anyway. But modern science, as I said, requires the Judeo-Christian base from which to begin, a reasonable universe that has a logos behind it and a logos that we can pursue as rational and reasonable human beings. However, of course, it could be suggested that this basis is merely a chrysalis out of which modern science could emerge, fully fledged, and able then to fly on its own without the need for a base. But I would flag up, have a care, this can lead to the thought that undoes all thought. If all events are simply consequences of earlier events in an unseeing and purposeless cosmos, it follows that all thoughts are similarly meaning merely the byproducts of a chemical process in our brains. At this point, all reason plunges irrecoverably into a metaphorical black hole. My reasoning to deal with your reasoning is neither true nor false, but merely an epiphenomenon of neural activity in my brain. As I said, the great civilizations way, way back in the past, Egypt, Greece, China, India, even Rome, all actually failed to progress very far in the sciences as we would now describe them, partly because of their background lack of a solid base. Now, we often think the Greeks gave us modern science. They did only in a sense. The reintroduction of Greek philosophies of Aristotle and Plato into the West uh, in the, uh, just the post-medieval period, in a sense, held back science. It broke through, but it did, in a sense, hold it back. The tendency for the church, and here was one of its many mistakes, to grasp the uh, astronomy, and as ben Benoit would remind us, the astrology of Ptolemy, uh, tended to prevent discussion. Problem? Nothing new there. We seem to be there again. Often, too, because much of it was bound up, if it not, not with the, that kind of thing, with philosophy, they were often asking the wrong kinds of questions. The question why, rather than the question how, which is far more the domain of science. It's not the only question it can ask. I want to read a, a quote from a book by Rodney Stark called The Victory of Reason. And although this is not primarily about science, it's about the development of the West that followed to a considerable degree with the de uh, hand in hand with the development of science and also of the material well-being of the West. And he concludes his book by quoting one of China's leading scholars, modern China's leading scholars, quote, one of the things we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, the preeminence of the West over all the world. We studied everything we could from the historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on our economic system. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. 
That is why the West is so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. That's Chinese, modern Chinese scholars. Interesting statement. So, if there is a base, and if it is the Logos, and I would say God, what about the scientists who, as it were, laid our foundations in terms of Western development, people like Newton and Kepler? Well, interestingly, I have a quote from Kepler, which was a prayer. O oh God, I am thinking thy thoughts after thee. That was Kepler. Newton said it somewhat similarly, but perhaps with less reverence. He said, I'm merely thinking God's thoughts after him. So I would hold that this gives us the principles as not only of research, of logic and reason and experiment, and it's important that we get it right. And that if we don't, of course, we get ourselves into trouble. But in the Old Testament or the Torah, we have all sorts of useful pragmatic rules as well. The first one I would quote, familiar to most of us, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Lying in scientific papers is giving false testimony to your neighbor. Here's another one. It seems frightfully practical and domestic. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. <laughs> use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Similarly in the Torah, a repeat of the same thing. Do not have two differing weights in your bag. <laughs> one heavy, one light. Do not have two differing measures in your house. One large, one small. You must have accurate and honest weights and measures so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And here from Rabbi Shaul or the Apostle Paul, another one, test everything. Hold on to the good. Now all these form of obvious foundation that I know all of us here as scientists or interested in science would hold to. Honest weights, honest measures, not telling lies, being honest about doubt, saying that you don't know and if you don't know, uh, making it clear. As Bertram Russell put it, ascertainable truth is piecemeal, partial, uncertain and difficult. Just because you do these things honestly doesn't mean to say it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean to say that the research will just drop out of the sky. I wish it would, but it doesn't. Things don't always work out. It's a hard slog, but it's worth it. And the Lord God used the old fashioned word, you get a blessing. A blessing of discovering God's thoughts after him. But if you break these principles, there will be what again the Bible will call judgments that will follow at very least with confusion of thought and action, but more likely with serious dangers for human life. Ignore the findings from proper reason and proper data to suit your own ideas, and bridges will collapse, ships sink, planes fall from the sky, and uh, space probes go awry. Twist the data about climate and the atmosphere and predictions you will cause agricultural disasters, waste vast sums of money, and as I'm sure Christopher's going to be sharing with us, it is the poor who suffer the worst because of this. And God doesn't view that with any kindness. In the public forum, which should be the domain of science, I think there's a lot of confusion anyway about the scientific process. As we've had from the media, the journalists and the media broadcasters will say, scientists tell us. And the public, therefore, must be under the impression that an oracle has spoken the truth and must therefore be accepted. Again, the Torah comes to our aid. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Somebody gets up and says something. If a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord, what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously do not be afraid of him. Now there's a message to take home as well when we are dealing with these people. Now, how am I doing? 
Five minutes, okay? Well, we'll spin on a bit. I think most of us fully understand the nature of um, hypothesis, theory, and law. Uh, how they work in science, how a hypothesis is a bright idea that some guys has, and scientists have bright ideas every morning, and by the evening most of them are dead. Um, but every occasionally one survives a bit and you start testing it, and if the experiments support it, and indeed experiments you should be conducting against your hypothesis also still show that your hypothesis is correct, then it can move towards becoming a theory. And of course a theory, well, uh, it remains a theory. Uh, it may be adapted. It may eventually fall. And it is never true, except in the sense that it is provisionally true. And that's an important thing to remember. Way back again in the time of Newton, there was, as it were, a parting of the ways in the way science worked between Newton and Descartes. Now, Descartes was actually a philosopher in the Greek tradition. And he believed in the power of mathematics, as did Newton, in understanding the world we live in. But he worked far more on the principle that if I imagine how something works, and I can make my maths make it look good, then that's what happens. Newton, for all his many faults, would go the other route. I will see what happens when I do experiments, and then I will apply my mathematics to pull it together. That's how Newton worked. And of the two, primarily, and I'm not, I don't want to cast total aspersions on, uh, on Descartes in this regard, but nonetheless, Newton was right, and Descartes essentially was taking a dangerous route. The trouble is, Descartes is with us again today in all the computer models that we see being manufactured in so-called climate science. That is Cartesian science. It is saying, this is what I imagine happens, and I will twiddle my machines until it seems to fit the data. Which is why, as an earlier speaker rightly said, how few of these people are out in the field doing what Newton did, which was to find out what was happening before deciding how to put it together and begin to make some understanding of it. So, Newton was on the right lines, but sadly today it seems to me as if Descartes is back in fashion. The imaginary world of computer models rules over the real world of facts and observations. Let me again quote those Chinese professors, and with this I'm going to end. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West is so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. Is it then, perhaps no coincidence, but as the West abandons its baseline for science, by abandoning the Judeo-Christian perspective that we are seeing the rise of ideological pseudoscience based not on reason, but on ideologies which stem just from the human imagination. Thank you, gentlemen.